1999, there was a big story in Chicago about how the baby Jesus figure had been stolen from the nativity scene at Daly Plaza. And eventually the police recovered the baby at the bus station after an anonymous tip. After that first theft, they started securing the baby Jesus figure with a cord and a bolt and a padlock to the manger so that nobody would steal it again. But their security measures didn't work because in 2004 the same thing happened. This time it was a 19-year-old college student who was able to slip the baby out from underneath the cable. The law caught up with him two days later. They returned Jesus to the manger. This guy got charged with a misdemeanor. So they upped their security measures once again, and now there's a team of people known as the God Squad. And it's their job to make sure that the baby Jesus doesn't get stolen anymore from Daly Plaza. They're very tight-lipped about the security measures that they've put in place. But the goal of these guys is to make sure that Jesus never leaves the manger again. So, you know, I think that's an okay goal for them to have. But, as Christians, I hope that we don't make the mistake of leaving Jesus in the manger. If we leave Jesus in the manger, then people are left with this sweet image of a baby in the manger, and he lays down his sweet head, and no crying he makes. But then if people transfer that image to Jesus as an adult, then they picture Jesus as this mild, gentle person who speaks softly so that he never disturbs anyone. But nothing could be farther from the truth. The life of Jesus turned our world upside down, so we need to make sure that we do not leave Jesus in the manger. As we look at the Christmas story, we see that peace permeates the Christmas story. As you get Christmas cards in the mail this year, there's a good chance that some of them are going to carry this theme of peace. You might get a card that looks something like this, peace on earth and you have the manger scene. And you know, peace really is a good theme to be stressed at Christmas time. Our world truly needs to find peace. I don't know about you, but we need peace desperately. Families need peace. We all need peace. When you look at God's word, you see that this theme of peace was stressed with the coming of Jesus. The prophet Isaiah, writing 700 years before Jesus came, and he prophesied that when the Messiah comes, when this divine king is born, he will be the prince of peace. This is what we read in Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So when Isaiah calls Jesus the Prince of Peace, that's an amazing title because Isaiah was writing during a time when kings were seen as those who brought war and destruction on people. And then when we move to the New Testament, you know that on the night that Jesus was born, there were shepherds out in the fields keeping watch over their flocks of sheep. And Luke 2 tells us that the angels appeared to them saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. So the Bible makes it clear that Jesus would be the Prince of Peace, and he came to establish peace on this earth. But could the establishment of peace actually call for a period of unrest? In Matthew 10, Jesus says something that really should surprise you. You know, we thought we clearly understood why he came, but just when you think you have Jesus all figured out, he surprises you with something that he says. In Matthew 10, we have Jesus calling his 12 disciples, and he sends them on a mission to proclaim the kingdom of God throughout the villages and towns of Israel. And he gives them specific instructions. They're to heal the sick, raise the dead, drive out demons, and to proclaim the good news. And then he tells them that on this mission, guess what? You're going to be persecuted. He says, people are going to hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And then in verse 34, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, makes a very surprising statement. He says, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Okay, I am now officially confused. The Prince of Peace just said he did not come to bring peace to the earth. He did not come to bring peace, but a sword. 
Does that mean the angels were wrong when they made their announcement to the shepherds? Does this mean I need to return all my Christmas cards that say peace on earth? I just don't see Hallmark having a top-selling Christmas card that shows Jesus with a sword saying Merry Christmas. Jesus says he did not come to bring peace but a sword. So what exactly does that mean? Well, maybe we need to start by saying what it doesn't mean. First, we need to make it clear that Jesus was not speaking literally here. Jesus is not talking about literally pulling out a sword and wielding it around. He never does that anywhere in the Gospels. And we need to read this statement in the larger context of this chapter. Earlier in verse 5, when Jesus is giving instructions to his disciples as they go out on this mission, he tells them what they should bring with them. He says, don't bring any money. Don't even bring a bag to put anything in. Don't bring an extra change of clothes. Don't bring extra shoes. Don't bring a walking stick. He certainly doesn't tell them to bring a sword. So Jesus is not speaking literally here. He's not using the sword as, he is using the sword as a metaphor or as a symbol. So what does it represent? You know, most of us think of a sword as an instrument of violence. It's a weapon of warfare. So is that what he means? That he's come to bring death and war to the earth? You know, it's sad, but some people have actually interpreted this verse that way throughout history. Some have tried to use that verse to justify war against non-Christian cultures. But that's a terrible misinterpretation of what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is not using the sword as a symbol for violence. We need to remember that this is the same Jesus who told us to love our enemies, pray for those who persecute us, He modeled that for us as he hung on the cross and prayed to forgive those who at that very moment were killing him. And we need to remember that this is the same Jesus who told Peter to put away the sword because those who live by the sword will die by the sword. So Jesus is clearly not advocating violence in this verse. That's not what this symbol means. So what does it mean? Just when you think you have Jesus all figured out, he surprises you with something he says. I hope that you realize God is like that. You never get him figured out. You're reading along and then, wow, this goes totally against what I understood. I think the key for understanding this verse is to understand the word peace. The word that he uses here can refer back to the Old Testament word shalom. And this word doesn't simply mean peace as in the absence of violence. Instead, it's a peace that comes from wholeness or being completely unified. It's the wholeness that comes when nothing is missing and everything is one. So what Jesus is saying in this context is, don't think I've come to bring wholeness or unity. I did not come to bring unity but division. He's using the image of the sword to illustrate cutting something in half or dividing something into pieces. And if you jump over to Luke's Gospel... Jesus says this in in Luke 12, Do you think I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I have come to divide people against each other. So Jesus isn't using the image of a sword to advocate violence. Instead, the sword illustrates the division that Jesus brings to life. And when you look at the rest of this chapter in Matthew, it really fits what's going on here. When Jesus sent his disciples on this mission in this chapter, what happened? The towns weren't united in welcoming them. Instead, there were divisions, and they faced persecution. Jesus is on a mission to turn the world upside down, and we see him doing that even from the moment of his birth. When King Herod heard that the Messiah, the divine king, had been born in Bethlehem, he was greatly disturbed, because even as a baby, Jesus was a threat to his power. Jesus came to turn the world upside down, so Herod tried to have this child killed. When Mary and Joseph brought Jesus as an infant to the temple to be dedicated, there was an old man there named Simeon who recognized this baby was God's deliverer. And in Luke chapter 2 it says, Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. Simeon recognized that Jesus was going to turn this world upside down and there was going to be division as far as those who were for him and those who were against him. So if there is one misconception of Jesus that we need to correct this season, I think it might be this. 
Many people view Jesus as this passive Savior, some sort of pushover Messiah, someone who came to make us feel better. But we need to erase that image from our minds. Jesus is the most radical person who ever walked the earth. He did not come to bring peace. He came to bring division and turn the world upside down. And the way he does it is like this. Jesus is on a mission to dethrone every illegitimate king that is out there. Jesus wants to dethrone every illegitimate king, and he wants to make sure that we give allegiance to the only true king. He's calling all people back into communion with God, and he's inviting people to be part of his Father's kingdom. And Jesus invited people who everybody else thought were disqualified from being connected to God. Remember, he invited the sinners, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, all those who were on the outskirts of society. He welcomed them back into communion with God, and the good news is he welcomes us back into communion with God. Jesus invites us to love God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the reason why this is threatening and why this turns the world upside down is because to be back in proper relationship with God, that means we have to take something else in our lives out of that place that shouldn't be there. Every one of us has put something in the place that rightfully belongs to God alone. And just as Herod was threatened by the birth of this rival king, every one of us should be threatened by the birth of Jesus because Jesus has come to dethrone whatever is on the throne of my life and your life. So let's say that we're giving something too much allegiance or devotion in our lives. Something has a grip on our lives and we're way too attached to it. We give way too much time and devotion to it. You know, I think it's easy to spot something like that when it's something bad, like pornography or an addiction to drugs or alcohol or gambling. You know, we can see that stuff has to come off the throne of our life and then you replace it with Jesus because he alone is the rightful king. I think we see that. I was in a waiting room the other day, and there was this other guy in the waiting room. And that guy's cell phone rang, and he answered the call, and he carried on his phone conversation in a really loud voice so that people 10 yards away could hear everything he was saying. You ever been around somebody like that? His call went something like this. Yeah, Bill, how did the court session go? Yeah, it could have been a lot worse. You, you know what you've got to do now is you've got you to get clean. you got to... Totally cut ties with your old friends who are using. Look at me. You know how hard it was for me, but I got through it, and that's what you got to do. Stop hanging out with those old friends. You can do it. Actually, I think he's given some pretty good advice. He's saying that bad stuff that was on the throne of your life, that's got to come off. You can't stay there anymore. Come to your senses. That stuff's got to go. And as Christians, we know that comes off the throne and Jesus needs to go on the throne. I think that's pretty good advice. You know, I think when something bad like pornography or drugs has a grip on your life, then we see how we need to make a clean break from that and replace it with Jesus. But what do you do when something good has a grip on your life? And you're giving way too much time and devotion to this good thing in life. You know, Jesus came to dethrone that good thing as well. Because God alone deserves our full devotion. You know, maybe you thank God for a job that he provided, and it started out as a good thing. But then you became a workaholic, and that good thing now gets way too much time from your life. Maybe you thank God for providing a house for you to live in, and that house was a good thing. But maybe now the house gets all your time and attention And God just gets the leftovers. And you know what? In Matthew 10, Jesus gets really specific. And he shows us some things that need to get dethroned. One false king in our life can be family. Look at what he says in verse 35. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. If you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or your daughter more than me, you're not worthy of being mine. Do you realize what a bold statement he's making here? What kind of person would be so bold as to step into your life and say, you need to love me more than you love your children. 
To make that bold of a statement, you'd have to be like the Son of God or something. Nobody else would have the right to make that statement. But God does. Maybe we could look at it this way. If there really is a God, and if he's the creator of all things, if he created you and me, if everything in existence draws its life from God, if he's eternal without beginning or end, if we are infinitely dependent upon him for our existence every moment and every second of our life, if our connection to this God is in one form or another going to exist for all of eternity, then does it not follow that our relationship to this creator God should have supremacy above all other things? I'm dependent on him for every breath I take. Shouldn't he get the glory and supremacy above all? Jesus wants us to recognize the supremacy of God over all things. The one who created your mother, your father, your son, and your daughter, he deserves your allegiance more than they do. He deserves your allegiance more than they do. You know, Louise and I prayed for our kids before they were born, and we were very thankful to God when they were given to us. But what happens if we then get so carried away in loving our kids that God gets pushed off to the side. And pretty soon our calendar revolves around our kids. And if you look at our Facebook page, we're constantly bragging about our kids. And more and more of our money gets spent on our kids to the point where God starts getting the leftovers of our time and money. If someone took a close look at our life, they could easily say, Sure looks like you worship your kids more than you worship God. Is God still on the throne of our life, or have we put family on the throne of our life? When I come to the end of my life, my family will not save me. God alone can rescue. God alone can save. And that's why he deserves our highest praise and devotion. And you know, the beautiful thing that happens when you give God that top place in your life is this. God says, you know what? I now want you to be a godly spouse. I want you to be a godly parent. I want you to honor your father and your mother. I want you to love and discipline your kids. When you give God this top spot in your life, he calls you to treat other family members with love and respect. So you're really not sacrificing your family. You're giving God the glory he deserves, and he calls you to be a great family. And then finally, another false king can be self. Look at verse 38. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. So Jesus is using another symbol here. A cross was a symbol of death and execution. Jesus is saying that we must be willing to sacrifice ourselves and to put aside our own desires and ambitions and put Christ first. So self-denial is not popular in this country. We're Americans. We're all about self-achievement and self-betterment. But Jesus is calling us to practice self-denial. You know, I mentioned at the beginning that the baby Jesus figure had been stolen from the Daily Plaza a number of times. There's a Roman Catholic church in New York City where the Jesus figure has been stolen as well, but that figure of Jesus is a 200-pound plaster statue of Jesus. And thieves broke in and they took it, but the interesting part was this. This was a Roman Catholic church, so Jesus was, was part, of the, part of a crucifix. He was on this much bigger cross. But the thieves unbolted Jesus from the cross and took him. And the guy who was responsible for the artwork in the church was perplexed by this. He wondered why they didn't steal the whole piece of artwork. Why did they just take Jesus? And you know what? I think that theft was indicative of our culture. We want Jesus, but we don't want the cross. Isn't that true? We want Jesus, 
but we don't want the cross. We want all the benefits of the Christian faith. I want forgiveness of my sins. I want peace and hope and love and joy, but I don't want the cross. I don't want that self-denial and the self-sacrifice that goes with that. But Jesus reminds us again, if you cling to your life, you're going to lose it, but if you give up your life for me, you will find it. So that path of self-sacrifice really is the way to finding true life. So as we end this message, let's remind ourselves that we can't negotiate with Jesus. We can't bargain with him where we offer to give him this much of our life and then hold back this part. The birth of Jesus was a threat to Herod. The life of Jesus is a threat to every illegitimate king in our lives. He has come to dethrone the false kings so that the true king can get his rightful place in our lives. So we don't negotiate with this king Instead, we surrender and we worship this king. And the beautiful thing is, you find true peace when you make Jesus king. We really do get back to peace when we make Jesus king. So let's end the service giving God the glory he deserves, and I pray that you will experience peace that comes when Jesus is king. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just pray right now that you'll give us a glimpse of your glory. I think if we just had a glimpse of your glory, we would just bow and surrender and dethrone any false God in our life and give you the glory that you deserve. And Lord, it's a, it's a path that involves self-sacrifice. I pray that we're willing to take that step and follow you. And Lord, as we do that, we're going to experience a beautiful peace that only you can give. So I pray that for our brothers and sisters here today, for all of us. May Jesus alone be king. May we experience your peace as we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name.